So hello everyone and welcome to the Space Awareness Webinar, Intercultural Science Education on the example of the Space Awareness Islamic Heritage Kit. My name is Marina Jimenez and I will moderate this session. So with us today we have Dr. Cecilia Scorza. Please I remind everyone to turn down their volumes otherwise you cannot hear me properly. So again, with us today we have Dr. Cecilia Scorza. She's an astronomer and educationalist with a PhD in astronomy from the University of Heidelberg. Cecilia is renowned for her expertise in astronomy education and educational resources. She worked at the House of Astronomy, a unique center for astronomy education and outreach in Heidelberg, Germany. She has been also closely involved with the IAU Universe Awareness Program for Disadvantaged ch Children since its inception, and she has also worked many years for the German Sophia Institute um, in Sofia. So currently, Cecilia is developing the Islamic Heritage Kit for the EU Space Awareness Program, which is, a, is addressed to children with immigrant background, in particularly Muslim children, at aims for a bridge between the Islamic world and Europe. During this webinar, you will get a review on the methodologies and science education that take into account multicultural aspects in science teaching. On the example of the Space Awareness Islamic Heritage Kit, the presenter will demonstrate which cultural and historical aspects are the best suitable elements to enhance the self-esteem of Muslim children and to build a bridge between the Islamic world and modern space science and astronomy. My colleague Noel, who is here with the Scientix account, will be helping you with any technical problems you may have, so please write to her privately in the chat if you experience any difficulties in attending the session. Also, please remember to turn down your cameras and your microphones and not to take the presenter role, which is the little circle you will see next to Cecilia or to my name in the list of participants. At the end of the session, we will have 15 minutes in which you will be able to address questions to our experts through the chat, but you can still post them during the whole webinar in the chat as well, and I will be recording them and I'll ask them later. So that's all. I leave the floor to Cecilia right now, and I hope you all enjoy. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes or no? Yes, yes we can hear okay. you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to talk on the topic of intercultural science education, and I will give some examples as, ex as an example the Islam Heritage Kit, which have, we have been developing since two years, um, linked to the program Space Awareness with um, a, a couple of, of colleagues. I will introduce them to you later on. And during this talk, I will be addressing the following topics, which are the goals of intercultural science education. What are we doing when we bring science into other cultures? Which methods have been successfully implemented? And in view of the chronic Program, problem that Europe has been facing because there is an underrepresentation of children with migrant, immigrant background and Muslim children choosing space carriers and scientific carriers. In view of this chronic problem, we have been developing some materials and testing them with some children. And, um, this is the main project linked to astronomy and space science education for Muslim children, the Islam Heritage Kids. And um, our goals are to show to the children and to the teachers that science is a transcultural endeavor and um, to make them understanding legacy and to show them that their ancestors and um, many Islamic and Muslim scholars contributed to the development of astronomy and space sciences. And in doing so, we would like to build a bridge between the Islamic culture and hero. And we want to enhance the third team of Muslim children. And I will be presenting a list, a literature list. So I would like to begin with a, a very old and wise phrase of the philosopher Aristoteles, and this is Pantes Anthropoi to Edenai Oregontai Fuse. This means all humans by nature desire to know. And indeed, Homo sapiens has been exploring the world to make sense of it, to understand it, adapt to it, to live on it. And what we should understand 
is that there are many worldviews that make sense of the world. And these many worldviews have developed systems of knowledge. And I will be talking about two types of knowledge system. I will group on one side the non-Western cultures and on the other side the Western cultures where scientific thinking has been playing a major role in, since hundreds of years. So um, I want to characterize these two types of knowledge systems. The non-Western knowledge, uh, non-Western cultures the, um, they are more enclosed. They have knowledge system that is much more enclosed and it's very culture dependent. And the explanations, um, they are allowed to make sense of the world, but they are not questioned. And they are passed through the follower, following generation without revising them. And um, the identity is built upon all these beliefs and, and all this knowledge. And um, they, they, this type of explanation is very local. Um, these non-Western countries um, have been developing a lot of techniques on trial and error. And this was the case of the Western culture before the science, um, rational science, scientific thinking arose. Um, on the other hand, we have now the Western science culture and um, this is characterized by a, by a rational way of scientific thinking. And um, in this field or in these uh, knowledge systems, explanations are revised and explore, uh, exploration and research is an open endeavor and it has an open end. And this type of uh, knowledge aims for universal explanation. So the natural laws are um, a part of it, uh, are a good example. They are not only valid here on the earth, but anywhere on the universe. And a typical, uh, a typical product of the Western scientific culture is the technology. And this is based on, on science. And all the devices that we use today, mobiles, computers, are based on technology that is you need science behind that to construct and develop these devices. So I am not showing you um, a system of values. I am not saying what's better and what's worse. I'm just mentioning some characteristics of these two types of worlds that we would will, will like to bring together. So I, I will now give you an example um, of explanations the topic, the seasons. And we pick up the explanations that we find in Greek mythology, for instance. And this is the um, myth of Persephone. And she was the daughter of Demeter. This is then the goddess of the earth, fertility, agriculture, and harvest. And um, Persephone was gathering flowers on a field and was suddenly kidnapped by Hades and she disappeared on the underworld. And her mother got desperated and she became very sad. And for the first time there was winter on the earth. She went to Zeus, to the father of, of all gods, and begged him to give her back her daughter. But it happens that Hedus, Hedus is the brother of Zeus, and he decided that Persephone would stay half of the year with her mother and then the other half of the year with her husband on the underworld. So each time that Persephone arises on the heavens and is visible under the constellation of Virgo, her mother becomes very happy and nature becomes fruitful and then you have spring and summer. And the other months which Persephone stays on the underworld the nature, the image becomes very sad and then you have winter again. This is very typical for a magical religious um, knowledge system. Now what, what is saying, us, what do we hear about the astronomy in this case? Well, astronomy says that it is the tilted axis of the Earth that causes the seasons 
because sometimes times times of the year the solar rays reach the earth with high inclination and then it's winter and six months later the sun rays reach the surface perpendicularly and then we have summer. So you can choose whether the explanations you like. Um, I think I won't ask you this question. I, I would just remark that scientific explanations require observation, experiments, and tests. And this is a very sharp sword in, in science. You have to prove and you have to, you have to test your ideas. And this is, of course, belongs to the scientific thinking as proposed by Popper. So these are two these apparently very different worlds, and our um, aim is to build a bridge between them. So let me see. Okay. Um, there have been a lot of people, colleagues, working on, on building this connection, and one of them is Eichenhead, and he works in Canada. And his approach consists of calling all cultures subcultures. Science, Western science is also a subculture and there are many subcultures. And what he does is that when he, when he works with teachers and children of other communities outside the Western uh, culture, um, they just make a radio of their beliefs and their connections to nature. And then, a part of that, they learn the canon of the Western science culture. And um, they then pass from one world to the other, but these worlds remain unconnected. And um, I have problems, of course, with this approach because we know that even our children, when they learn physics, they have problems. Although they belong to the Western countries. Uh, an example is intuitive physics, uh, which is cross-cultural. That is, children develop intuitive way of explaining the emotion of bodies, uh, which is wrong under the view of the academic physics. For example, to keep an um, object in movement, you need to exert a force the whole time. And um, this is not, um, this is in contradiction with the academical physics. So, um, if you take into account the friction forces, then you can um, realize that the body will not um, need to require a force to be exerted on it to keep on moving. So we have problems here. The other thing is that other subcultures um, have been in touch with high-tech devices, and everybody is using these devices. And they are blind users of these devices. Um, an example is the mobile phones. And most of us are also blind users. So these worlds are not so separated as for 100 years. And um, I can give you a, show you an example of the use of mobiles everywhere. I was amazed to, when, to, see, to see these pictures. And um, the thing is, the problem everywhere is that people enjoy handling with these devices, but they are not asking themselves how they work. So the curiosity is not there anymore. Uh, people define themselves as, as users. And well, you can see in Zimbabwe, you can you you, you have no electricity, so you have to charge your mobile um, with solar power. And uh, this is really an extreme. We are all dependent on, on this high tech and we don't know how, how it works. So this is a big challenge for us teachers. My uh, own approach, what I have been trying since 14 years, is um, to look into a context on the non-Western culture and try to match uh, sign con content. So to give you an example, if you find a group of people like Indians in Venezuela, where I come from, and they conceive the earth as a goddess, uh, I won't go there and contradict them and tell them, well, you know, the earth is a planet like other planets of the solar system. 
I will just pick up um, their emotional connection to the Mother Earth and show them that we have been investigating how the Earth formed and we have come to 4.5 billion years of history of planetary formation and that the Earth is indeed very unique and very special. So we try to cope with their beliefs and in such a way that what I am saying makes sense for them. And um, um, some colleagues have done some work with children, um, members of the Cree Indians groups. And they, though they are, they are believing indeed on, on Mother Earth. And um, they develop a curriculum, science technology society curriculum, where they did some, perform some rituals, earth rituals with the children, rituals for planting seeds, and also join the children and their parents in the collection of wild rice, following the traditional techniques. But they also show the children how to measure the pH and to explain, explain them what is the pH of water and to um, link the pH of water to the, the capability of these plants to grow. And then they show them how technology of harvestation uh, and industrial processing of rice takes place nowadays. And at the end, they try to evaluate with the children the nature damages and what destroys the natural equilibrium. So I think this is a very good example of how to work with communities outside um, Western countries. So now um, I will show you what we have been doing with Islam Heritage Kids. And um, uh, we have chosen a context, as a context to join these two worlds, history. Um, only a few people are aware of the very important role that the Islamic scientists played during the golden ages of Islam, which matched perfectly with the Middle Ages on hero. And um, we have been working on this, my colleague Ron Mattis and two colleagues of Morocco, Hassan Danoui and Raya Saudi, and we have developed together some of the activities and I made the conceptual work and a lot of development work. So um, what we are trying to do with the kit is to cope with two problems. The problems, as I mentioned at the beginning, of the children with immigrant roots living here that don't choose scientific and space carriers at all. There is really a very strong underrepresentation. And on the other side, a huge amount of refugee children coming to Europe. And 90% of these people coming to us are Muslims. So we really need to build a bridge and to enhance their self-esteem. And the best way is to show them you are part of this endeavor. So we had made a very nice experience in Morocco showing the children that space awareness and space sciences and astronomy is part of their heritage and is part of their future. And it is very important very, very important to show to European teachers and children that the Islamic scientists contribute, contributed to the development of astronomy and space sciences. It's very, very important because this has been ignored a lot of time. And um, I'm showing you now a diagram showing some cultures, epochs, and the use that they made of astronomy. Um, I will begin mentioning roughly the Babylonians, India, the Mayas, the Chinese. They were looking at the sky. They discovered the periodicity of the movement of celestial bodies like the stars or the planets. And they linked that 
to time, to time measurement. That is, they devoted themselves during thousands of years to construct calendars and then coping that to agriculture, religion, and also the time to pay the taxes. Later on, something happened. It happened 600 years before Christ in Miletus. This is a harbor city, and uh, a lot of ideas met there. And there was a man, a merchant called Talus, and he really started to think in another way. So he separated the explanations linked to God, to mythology and religion, and started to ask himself, which are the principles that shape nature? And he imagined that water was a very important element. So this is really marking a new type of way of thinking. And this is the emergence of time of scientific thinking. And uh, it went to Athens and then to Alexandria in the case of astronomy. And it flourished strongly in Alexandria. But unfortunately, 500 uh, after Christ, um, there was a lot of fighting, and these ideas were forbidden by the emperor. So uh, this was damned to disappear, condemned to disappear from Europe. And um, a group of um, Christians belonging to the Nestorian sect brought these ideas to Persia. And when the Muslims expanded and conquered Persia, they found these wonderful ideas and they contributed further to their development in four aspects. Um, they were gathering, translating, improving, and disseminating. And this is unique. This didn't happen in Peru before. This huge amount of dissemination work and effort. And um, after that, the Muslims brought these ideas to Spain and they came back to, to Europe again. So many experts think, think that the Muslim, this is golden age of the Islamic world, triggered the Renaissance in Europe. So the contents of the kit, and there is a manual linked to it, um, are the following. There is an introduction, uh, and then the second chapter is devoted to the birth of the astronomical ideas. The third chapter, the rise of astronomy as a science. This happened in Greece, as I told you before. And then the long way to back that, the Islamic Golden Ages. And the main part of the kit centers of two, um, four main figures and there are Islamic scientists. I will get back to this later. In the future, I will be happy to join anybody uh, wanted to help on the development of two other topics. So in the introduction, in the introduction, you have a, a summary of this story that I already told you of how these ideas were developed in Babylon and in Egypt and went to Miletus, this harbor place, harbor city, and then something happened um, with the natural philosophers, a new way of approaching nature, and this was brought to Athens and then to Alexandria. And uh, this chapter is devoted to this historical uh, background. And there is also a map that you are looking at now and this map allows the children to place what they discover in the activities, in the hands-on activities of the kids, and to place them on a context. And this is very important because otherwise the information gets lost. So you have to link a lot of, of aspects here. And um, this map and these cards that are belonging to the kit are very important also for the evaluation. So you, you can teach with the map and the cards and the figures, and at the same time you can make an evaluation of, of the um, knowledge transfers that the children are doing, or the links between one figure, for instance, and its instrument, or the city where um, 
where one of the figures lived. So, um, and this is part of the kit, the map. And then we have the second chapter. It's linked to the rights of astronomy for practical and religious uh, purposes. And as I told you, the Babylon and Egyptians, they made a lot of measurements. And the activities of this um, part of the kit of the manual are linked to measuring time, constructing a sundial, uh, learning cuneiform digits, and discovering the legacy of having a day divided into 24 hours, and each hour into 60 minutes, each minute into 60 seconds. This was set up by the Babylonian because they used this hexagesimal system, and we use it today. And the other important aspect is the measurement of the year, and this was an achievement of the Egyptian astronomers, who each time Sirius arose at the east, they link this movement and this appearance on the sky with the Nile inundation. And this is very important for the agricultural culture and uh, for, for the development of the civilization. So they count the days between each appearance of Sirius on the east to the next time, and this made 360 days for a year. And there is some activities linked to that also. So we come now with the, to the chapter number three, to the rights of astronomy as a science and the ideas of Thales and the natural philosophers. And here a very important figure is Anaxagoras, who was the first uh, natural philosopher explaining the moon phases and the solar and moon lunar eclipses. And 100 years later, Aristoteles observed during a, a lunar eclipse the, the shape of the shadow of the Earth on the moon and recognized that it was round. And then, since then, they knew that the Earth was uh, round. He also observed the inclination of the stars uh, at the sky when you move south. So they were looking for proof of the shape of the Earth. And then hundreds of years later, you have Eratosthenes 200 BC measuring the circumference of the Earth. And in the Universe Awareness Program, uh, which you probably all know, we have an inflatable ball. And um, my colleague Romatis made a very nice um, activity related to Eratosthenes to measure the circumference of the Earth. And of course, we tell also the story of Hypatia which was tragically murdered by uh, fanatics belonging to the, some Christian sects. sects. And, um, and this shows why these ideas went to Constantinople and a while later they were just prohibited. So as I mentioned before, a group of Christians belonging to the Nestorian sect who were also forbidden by the church, they moved to Persia. And these are the members of the Eastern Church later on. But they took with them all the pergaments, the pergaments, and all the instruments that the um, Greek astronomers had developed in, in Alexandria. And then um, they settled down in Isfahan and in other Persian cities. And after 200 years, then the Muslims conquered Persia, and they brought everything to Baghdad. And then, this is, marks the beginning of the Golden Ages, something incredibly happened. Baghdad was founded, and you can see Baghdad on the 9th century, a city with one and a half million habitants, with a lot of hospitals, schools, and the Sultan Palace at the center with water, clean water. So it's amazing. During this time, our big cities in Europe were only very small towns. And um, in this city, a very special house was opened. This is the House of Wisdom. And in this House of Wisdom, a lot of wise men and women gathered together. And they started to gather all 
detects that they, the Nestorians brought to Persia. They made some journeys to India and to China, and they gathered everything and they started to translate into Arabic. Arabic is like English today for that time. And um, they improved this knowledge. There was a lot of exchange, and they invited also scholars from China and, and, and India and from the West to a, a space of six to one year at the House of Wisdom. So you see that um, the Islamic world was a very ambiguous world. It allowed for religion, but it allowed for a huge space to collect and improve and exchange knowledge. So this is something that, very, that uh, is very important. Many children, Muslim children, should, should know about this. And then we, we come into the subject of the four, mayor, the four main characters uh, of the kids. And these are two men and two women. And um, there is um, a man, a Sufi, who spent his um, whole life in Persia, which was at that time under a Muslim um, government, uh, mapping the sky. And, and then we have a lady in Aleppo called uh, Marian Astrolabia who developed very complicated and very nice astrolabs. Then we have a physicist, Al Haytham, who moved from Basra to Cairo and he played a key role in the development of the scientific method 300 years before it was known in Europe. And then we have a lady of Morocco, his fa Fatima al Fidi, who founded the first university of the world. So I will show you some aspects of the work done by these figures, by these scholars, and some of the activities that we have developed on the kids. Um, amazing is the work of Al Sufi. Um, he knew the Arabic constellations, that is the constellation used, used by the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula. And he did a wonderful work for us in building a bridge to the Greek constellations. And what he did is he did a matching work. He started to identify the Arabic constellations and the Greek constellations to identify who described itself, the, the, uh, the group of stars, the same group of stars. And he decided to keep the names of the Greek constellations, but to keep the star names of the Arabic constellations. That is, he makes the sky for us. And you see here at the left, the, the Arabic constellation of al -Yatta. This is a hunting goddess of the Arabs. And at the red side, Orion. And then he kept Orion. But the main star is Betel Jeuste, which means the hand of al Jashwa, this Arabic goddess. And um, I have developed some games for the kids with cards. So they, they need to match the Greek constellations with the Arabic ones and identify the stars, name the pronunciation of the stars, and the meaning of the stars. I'm an astronomer, and I am discovering a new world. I know what these star names are meaning, and some, they, some of them are linked to the old Arabic constellation and have nothing to do with the Greek constellations that we see today at the sky. And um, also at Sufi, he did careful observations of this guy, and he mentioned for the first time in, this, in history the Andromeda galaxy and described it as a very small cloud. And um, he measured the positions of the stars of the Andromeda constellation to describe the position of the Andromeda nebula. And also, he was the first astronomer to notice and to record the colors of the stars. So neither Ptolemaeus nor Eratosthenes or Hippocrates wrote anything about the um, colors of the stars. And he did so, and it's on his table. So we have been mapping the sky since 
uh, these Greeks started to do that. And um, you see here Gaia. So this is a legacy. It has been continuous due to the work of Asufi. Then we have Marian Astrolabia. I mentioned her, a lady from Aleppo, and um, her father was an instrument constructor. So she learned from her father, and she developed very complicated astrolabs and was appointed by the Sultan um, during a large period of time. So, and in the kit, we have some astrolabs, um, very easy ones for the smaller children, like this one for the primary school, and um, some more complex ones. And there are some activities uh, to measure, some, to make some measurements with the astrolabs so that they can really recognize the significance of this work. And of course, we also use instrument, um, measurement instrumentation today in astronomy. And then there is then the case or the, this amazing life of al Haita, a very young physicist who came from Basra in Iraq. And he was struggling during two and a half months to come to Cairo because the Sultan Dodd wanted to build a dam on the Nile River. And he was really convinced that he would achieve such a, a task. And fortunately, he recognized that it was not easy to do to build a dam, and he went along the river. So he was afraid of losing his head, and he simulated madness. And the Sultan had pity with him, and um, he was he spent 15 years uh, at home. And during this time, which is a story that remember as Galileo. During this time, he had um, uh, he devoted himself to optics and developed a theory of vision, which is unique and which is very modern. It's the same that uh, we use in medicine and biology um, today. And um, he broke with uh, the other tradition, also with the natural philosophers that were used to speculate and argument with ideas uh, to describe nature. No, he said, no, you have to prove it. You have to make an experiment. You have to build a model. And then you can trust what you're doing. And he developed for the first time the camera oscura as a model to show how the eyes work. And um, he proved that light comes into the eye and uh, an image, an inverted image is is built at the routine, and then the nerves go to the brain and put it back together, pack back again, so correct the, um, the, the direction of the image. And this is very amazing. And then he developed um, and he, a lot of experiments to discover and discover the laws of refraction. And he wrote a book of optics, which has three sections. A um, very detailed description um, of the rays um, of light and uh, using also geometrical approaches. So this is really amazing and had a huge influence in Roger Bacon, Johannes Kepler, Galileo, Newton, and um, Hawkins. And there are a lot of activities linked to that, to build an, a camera, and also to make all these refraction experiments with water. And then we are uh, approaching the, the last figure of the kit, which is Fatima al Sidi. And she moved from Tunisia because of some quarrels, some tribes, and fighting. And she was a refugee child. She came to Fez with her parents. And when her father died, um, who had given her a, a very special education, she decided to found the first university of the world in on her on, on his honor. And at that time, I'm talking about the ninth century, the subjects that were taught were Arabic astronomy, mathematics, medicine, music, and Islamic religion. And this university has been open since that time. Not a single day has been closed. And at the right you can see Al Fidi's diploma diploma. This is she studied here. Um, you see two children, two children that arrived the coasts of Europe 
um, one of them hugging the other and comforting him and telling him, we are there, we have arrived, we are safe from, from the worst, for, from all the misery of, of our country. And, and this story, it's a, a very nice story. Raja, my colleague of Morocco, tells a very nice story where you see that a refugee child um, makes the best of the new world. And um, this is really very impressive for me um, to honor this lady, this woman, on, in, in our manual and with our activities. So we, we have been trying um, all these um, contents with children, and uh, especially during the Science Fest Festival, Explore Science uh, from the Klaus Hida Foundation. And uh, this, was, this was the station of the House of Astronomy. And I met her a teacher who um, taught me how to pronounce the names of the stars, and um, she joined us also. So I'm looking for people that um, could really work on, on fathering, developing these contents and on testing them. So we are approaching now the testing phase. So I, I really think that this effort um, that we have uh, put on developing these materials can really enhance the self-esteem of refugee children and children with migrant immigrant background. Um, we are part of this endeavor. This is very, 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 very important to show. Astronomy is connected to the Islamic culture, not only astronomy, space sciences and medicine, and you cannot imagine uh, the, um, how, how modern was the medicine in the, during the Golden Ages. Then um, we want to show also that during the Golden Ages, women and men worked together. This was really a fact. There are a lot of books telling us there is one philosopher um, who, who lived in, in Spain on the 12th century, and he wrote about 1,005 biographies of prominent women in, in the Islamic culture. This is amazing. The other aspect is that the Islamic culture helped to trigger the European Renaissance. So we, we have to really to, to show this, that we are really grateful. Otherwise, the Middle Ages would have lost much longer. And we, we have shown, or we will show with this kid, that science is a transcultural endeavor. And just to finish, um, I want to show you a, a, a brief list of literature, of books that have been written, and um, I have read them and very carefully and used them for the development of this content. And I will end up with a, a thought of Averroes a Muslim philosopher of the 12th century who lived in Cordoba. Ignorance leads to fear. Fear leads to hate, and hate leads to violence. And this is what we are living. We don't have an idea of these people. Just please help us to build this bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Cecilia, for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I want to tell the audience that we have now about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. If you, if anybody wants to post a question, um, on the meantime, just I want to read a couple of comments um, about people sharing their stories. Um, Al Murat CV. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. He just uh, mentioned that he's participating in any twinning project about Earth and space from space awareness. And Marina Moya, she mentioned that uh, she's participating in the Mission X training like an astronaut and the Earth Stuttiness experiment. So those were comments that I gathered while you were talking. Um, let me check. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Anastasia, she says, a great webinar. If we think about astronomy, we did not move far from basics during these centuries. The same laws of star movement are valid today. They did not change for thousands of years. The discoveries made this made by these scientists are amazing and change history of science. Um, I don't know if you want to comment anything on that? On the fact that we are looking at the same stars? I guess. 
<laughs> yes, well, it's indeed, a, it's like this. So humans will have been living on this earth only for a, a short while. And these stars will change in pattern, but it will take 100,000, 2,000, 200,000 years. So we are indeed looking at the same sky. And after I get, I got in touch with a Sufi, each time I look at Orion and I say, wow, this is Battle Josie, and I know where this name comes from. It's incredible. I, I really, I'm, I feel very connected to this heritage, and this is what we have to do with the children and, and, and teachers. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. So, um, well, I don't see many more, um, I don't see any questions apart from everybody seems to have really, really liked the, the webinar and the stories shared. So, otherwise, if it's, uh, if it's okay, I think, oh, wait, oh, yeah. wait, we have question. The questions are coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Elena okay. Fitzpolone, she says, what about parading? parading? What about? Paradigm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what does she refers to. Paradigm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Elena, if you're hearing, if you want to clarify that question, and then Sebastian Milona, she says some activities. Oh, she means examples. Ah, examples of what? <laughs> Uh, is the astrolabe and the stars on the website of, of this? Yeah, well, I have to tell you, very soon in April, we will have all these materials. So I can show you, for instance, this is the, the um, sundial, and, and this is the Egyptian calendar, yeah? And I, I have a prototype of the box, it's the first, uh, and the unique prototype now, and very soon these materials, and with all these figures, don't forget them, <laughs> will be, you can load them down and start working with children. So, just bring them to life. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, yes, they are available which, uh, with uh, the question. Um, yes, I don't know. Let's wait a couple more minutes to see if there's any other question. Okay, I see Marina Mola, that uh, her students are Muslims and they can test the materials. Um, I am really very interesting. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm very pleased to, to hear that. But if you have some questions, um, have you had, um, perhaps I can make a question, have you experienced uh, with teaching astronomy to Muslim children? They, um, Elena is asking as well if there's a kit for a class. And otherwise, uh, yes, I, um, if anybody wants to share anything, uh, any experience with uh, Muslim students, feel free to like comment it on the, on the chat as well. Yeah, some experience, Marina Mola. That's uh, very nice. Oh, yeah, he's a teacher of Turkey and all, of course, all the students are Muslim. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, that this is, this is the best context, the historical one to, to bring this world together. I cannot imagine another one. Yeah. To make them aware of this legacy. And we also, we have to, to think about that not uh, starting to, to uh, talk about the history of physics, starting with Galileo, and then mentioning Kepler and, and Newton. We have to start farther away, farther back. Yeah. Okay. I will try to do this test with the Bulgarian teachers, okay? Well, I don't know if, if there are no questions. Uh, I am. Yes, unfortunately, we're going to reach the time uh, limit of the webinar. So um, the last comments, they are, um, uh, I, I will try to do sets of Bulgarian t uh, teachers. We have to build up many different cultural and scientific uh, bridges. Um, very oh, helpful okay. for most of the audience I can see here. Yes, yes, I'm very happy to, to read this, really happy. Of course, the Greeks, they, <laughs> they are playing a very important role in this story, yes. 
Yes, well, Marina, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having it again. It has been a great uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to be closing the session now. For the audience, we will you will receive a follow-up email with the presentation and the details of the webinar. And uh, we hope to see you all again on the next Space Awareness webinar. And again, thank you, Cecilia, for a, an amazing presentation. And uh, we'll keep in touch. So we'll close the session now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. And good